Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. This was a motivation for me to put together a talk, which I wanted to put together, and uh, I think it really um, uh, deserves to be seen, not just by the people in this room, but by really millions of people across the country, because it addresses a very important issue, and that is managed care for IDD populations. Uh, <clears throat> so who am I to tell you about this? The IDD world is just beginning to deal with managed care. You just heard a very nice talk about um, Arkansas creating provider-led uh, managed care plans, uh, which it's been rocky, but at least they're provider-led and they're not uh, payer-led. And I'm going to tell you the difference between the two kinds of managed care plans in this uh, sector. The next decade, you're going to be sick of this. Just like us doctors. Doctors and hospitals have had decades of experience with managed care. It really originated in the 70s, and uh, most of us don't like it. Any doctor who does like it, I wouldn't trust them. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to assume that this population, I guess there's no physicians in this room except me, and uh, that you don't know much about managed care yet. Right? Um, I myself, I'm a third generation physician. So my grandfather, Creighton Edmondson, who was a family doctor in solo practice in Madison, Wisconsin. He came from Tennessee originally, that's his Tennessee wife and his Tennessee mother and his uh, eldest daughter. He started practice about 100 years ago, and in those days, maybe only 20% of the population had health insurance. So most of his patients didn't have insurance, and they would pay him. Those that could pay in cash did, and other ones would sometimes pay him in, would with a give payment in kind, uh, out of their card mineral. <clears throat> so um, he had a son, my father, Robert, and uh, Robert followed in his father's footsteps, eventually um, becoming a hematologist, oncologist. And my father began his practice around 1959, 1960, just as health insurance was spreading across the country. Now, a health insurance really um, uh, between it, it, it started to be a, a, a benefit of, of corporations that during World War II, because there was a wage freeze, and the only way they could attract workers would be to add benefits. Uh, really, by 19, the mid-60s or so, maybe 70% of the population was now covered by health insurance. Um, my father was tired of shoveling the Wisconsin snow, so he moved to sunny rural Northern California. He joined the Woodland Clinic Medical Group, where he biked to work, and he made house calls, and he was paid by fee-for-service health insurance, and uh, life was good. <clears throat> but there was some trouble. In the 1980s, a new kind of health insurance invaded California called managed care. And Dad did not like it one bit. His income suffered some. Uh, his partners moved on to greener pastures because a group that's organized to um, work with fee-for-service is not necessarily well organized to benefit from managed care. Um, and uh, so some of the other, his other partners were more nimble and they moved to other cities and, and made their arrangements. My father, rather, uh, chose to be a dinosaur. He didn't change his ways to adapt and he retired in place as soon as he possibly could, somewhat embittered by the experience. And you know, this is a recurring theme I'll, I'll, I'll point out throughout the talk that uh, the longer providers are in contact with managed care, the more unhappy they become. Yeah. Well, I um, followed in my father's footsteps, and I completed my MD and PhD degrees at New York University. I did my PhD thesis on brain development, and the logical clinical specialty uh, was neurology, so I became a board-certified child and adult neurologist. I had the good sense to marry my senior <laughs> resident pediatrics. <laughs> and lo and behold, perhaps ironic, we have uh, two sons on the autism spectrum. So here's, here's my beautiful wife, and this is Eric on the left, and that's Alexander in the middle. Um, I was in practice. I retired in 2008, roughly when they were about to start school, in order to help our boys full time. 
During all my scientific and medical training in brain development and uh, neurology, I never learned what a Medicaid waiver was. When patients would come to see me in the hospital and so on, they went home, I sort of puzzled, you know, what's it like to have a, have a family member like that? But they never trained us in this. I, that, was, that was something that was really not considered important. Um, I diagnosed and managed the care of hundreds of people with autism, intellectual delays, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, the whole list, right? But it was only when I had my own children that I really began to learn about Medicaid long-term services and supports. And I can now tell you there's little intersection between the worlds of acute care medicine and the IDD uh, world. Uh, all doctors must know about managed care because 90 plus percent of Americans are covered by that. You just can't escape it. And most doctors, as I say, have grown to hate it. Very few practicing doctors know much about the Medicaid system, as I just explained, right? Because these are separate worlds. Now, you all are going to be my representatives. When you go speak to your elected representatives uh, in Congress, and especially in the state, because a lot of these decisions are being made at the state level, right? I want you to take the knowledge I give you here as a warning, right? And to convey that it's not just so, it's not the sort of, um, situation where the governor says we're going to manage care and that's okay. It's not okay. No. Um, in terms of dollars, the acute care medicine side is about a hundred times bigger than IDD side, right? Uh, so they're huge. It's like a you know, playground building sort of situation. These worlds are incompatible. They think very differently. This is very, they think very differently. Person-centered planning, you guys are the experts, the national experts at that sort of thing. Right? And uh, in acute care medicine, we never talk about that. You, know, you imagine the doctor going to, uh, to your house to sit around the kitchen table with a friend and a nurse and so on. You know, Johnny has an ear infection. What do you think would be, uh, <laughs> would be something that Johnny would want to do about it? I mean, can you, let's brainstorm something. That's not how it works at all. Right? And it's, it, this is, unfortunately, they should remain separate, they're not gonna remain separate, right? So I'm here to tell you, forewarned is forearmed, beware of managed care. Before we go any further, let's explain, so we make sure everybody understands what I am talking about. This is an exchange, there's money and services. And I'm going to make a point to look for it. Most people here, their contact with uh, the healthcare system is as patients, right? You don't really normally think as a physician, as a provider, you don't think in terms of a payer. But to understand this, you have to take sort of a broader view. So I'm going to, to try to, to portray both sides. So we just have an exchange, right? We have a service and we have money. And there's two ways to um, manage that. One is you do the service first and then you pay for it. And the other is you pay first and get the service. It's that simple, right? So I'll use the example of a restaurant. Everybody can relate to that. So we're going to the fee-for-service cafe where you eat before paying, right? It's like an a la carte menu. So you, you, know, you say, I want this, I want that. You know, you want some dessert? Sure, we'll have some dessert too. Da, da, da. Um, you, you can't say ahead of time exactly what it's gonna cost, right? Um, and, and then next door to that is the managed care cafe where you pay a fixed price before eating. So for example, you know, the, the father wants to take his family out. It's uh, the week before payday. There's only a couple bills left in his wallet. Um, and he, he can't uh, necessarily go to a restaurant where he doesn't know how much it's going to be, but the the one place he can go is an all-you-can-eat buffet because he knows he's only going to pay this certain amount, right? So you can't predict the total. That one little thing, can't predict total, is what's driving the entire idea of putting IDD into managed care. Now, clearly, that's the wrong reason for doing anything in the IDD world, right? That's not person-centered. So now let's look at this from the standpoint of the owner of the restaurant or the provider of the medical services, right? On the fee-for-service side, the more services he provides, the more profit, right? So the more food he sells or more provider, you know, doing some calm hand, let's add in some respite, let's add in some speech therapy, let's add in this, right? The more things you can build for, the more profit, right? So it favors the provider who can you know, load up and promotes more utilization of services. Right? And this is a contributor to increasing Medicaid uh, inflation. Um, and that's a real factor. Right? Uh, under managed care, they already got all the money they're going to get. 
right up front, right? The more services they give, that just cuts into their profit margin, right? It means less profit, right? So it favors the payer, because the payer knows I'm paying X amount and that's it, right? But it promotes less utilization. And that should be a really red flag to everyone in this room, that you don't want somebody coming along and some bean counter saying that, well, you've already had too much, you can't get any, anything else. Right. So I'll go through a couple more examples, just to make sure everybody really understands this. Right. So uh, managed care, where did it come from? It comes from the acute care uh, sector. Right. So let's take some people. We have some healthy people and some sick people. Um, we'll take 100 people uh, you know, uh, from the phone book and enroll them in my managed care organization. And I'm, I'm a physician now. Right. Everybody's going to pay me 100 bucks a month, which is unrealistically low, but at any rate. Um, so that's 100 people times $100. That's $10,000 revenue per month they got. 90% right? of those people are not going to show up because they're healthy. They don't want to come to the doctor. Right? They paid me $9,000. Not bad. And they cost me nothing. That's free money. The other 10% of people have some medical issues. Right? They only paid me 1000 but it's going to cost me 5000 to take care of them. So I just take 4,000 of my free money to pay them, right? And this is called cost shifting, cost shifting, right? So that's a, a factor of, of managed care that is sort of, you know, it pits one group against another, right? <clears throat> See some, some heads nodding, that's good, right? Uh, the remaining 5,000 is overhead and profit, and you can instantly see that the more this, the more it costs me, the less profit, and the more profit, the less services. Right? So there's an inherent conflict where the provider is not necessarily working in the interest of the, the participant, the doctor. So let's, let's change the paradigm some. What if we were to now make this um, managed care plan for only people with IDD? Right? So um, everybody pays me $100 a month. I have the same revenue of $10,000. Right? 100% of these people require services every month. Okay. okay. They paid me $10,000, but I got to pay out $9,000 for the services. There's no free money anywhere in this system. There's no cost shifting. The only way I can make more money is by cutting services. So managed care is a fraud. <laughs> right? Now, as I mentioned, there's two kinds of managed care models that we have to distinguish between because we don't want to, we don't want you to get the idea that what's going on in Arkansas and a few other states uh, is, is, is absolutely a bad thing, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. And so, also, I want to say that um, Melissa just told you in Arkansas they carved out the state-operated ICFs from the managed care rate. As far as I've, my research shows, no states have carved in the uh, state-operated ICFs. Right. So people interested in ICFs, if your state is still operating them, um, so far they seem to be spared. But uh, you know they're under attack from a whole bunch of other reasons. Uh, the people eventually who uh, have to leave those have to go into group homes. Right? It's something you need to be aware of. Um, so this is really now about the voluntary sector. So we're going to make a chart where we have the payer, the provider, and the participant. Right? So you look at it. Just to remind you, the fee for service, the payer is the state Medicaid agency. The provider is the voluntary providers, you know, the ARC and UCP and so on. Right? And the participant is the disabled person who gets the services. What they're doing in Arkansas is so-called provider-led managed care. Again, the state agency, state Medicaid agency is still paying. And it's the same voluntary providers, only instead of being paid, uh, having to bill and being paid for your service, they're being paid a capitated amount, which is supposed to be calculated to be roughly the same amount of money. And if it's done right, it's not really much difference, right? So I don't really object to this so much, taking care. The one I do object to, the one that the doctors are so familiar with, right, is payer that managed care, where the state, uh, state Medicaid agency gives a lump sum to a for-profit corporation from some other state, who then has to negotiate fees with the voluntary providers. It's not going to be half as cozy, right, or even one-tenth as cozy to take care of the disabled people, right? Um, I'll give you a, a couple of more explanations. Why is this happening? What, who had this crazy idea? It's generally true that Medicaid is in, costs are going up because more people are enrolling, because uh, health care costs are increasing. The, the rates are, um, the cost to each state is increasing over time. And state budget directors have been told that uh, managed care is going to stabilize the cost, the costs, which is another way of saying cutting costs. Right? So 
So, so far in, um, in this year, uh, 39 states have invited in private corporate Medicaid managed care plans, right? which means 11 states haven't. And among those that haven't is, is Arkansas, right? Um, you're lucky. <laughs> Uh, if we come back in 10 years, there's going to be more orange and, and less blue here. Um, I'm going to uh, um, uh, make the point that uh, just like with everything having to do with Medicaid, is it's a it's a plan that's operated by every different every state. Federal money comes in, so CMS has some say over the matter. But every state's different, so this is really something. There's a there's a limit to um, what a, your uh, congressperson can do about it. Uh, it's really more to, something that has to be um, addressed at the state level, right? Um, states that uh, go um, from fee-for-service into managed care, uh, it's a change, right? So they they manage to find some kind of a crisis, right? First you need a crisis, and you never want to let a good crisis go to waste, right? So um, there's a certain kind of coercion. We're going to focus on the example of North Carolina. I'd say, first of all, is anybody here from North Carolina? All right, good. I hope it doesn't offend anybody. Um, uh, but the, the, the reason I choose North Carolina is they already have provider-led IDD managed care plans. They've had them for a long time. So what Melissa has said is it's unusual to start with that group. It's actually not so unusual. There are other states that are that have, have done something similar. Um, but North Carolina is set to be the next state to move its Medicaid population into payer-led managed care. That was the, the third line down, right? So the transition will illustrate the, the evolution and the history, all right? So uh, as I said, um, North Carolina, like several states, they have provided the IDD managed care system. It evolved locally over decades. This is a mom and pop uh, sort of agency, right? And uh, many states that do this uh, include not only the IDD, but also mental health and substance abuse. Some will include the senior population they're kind of multi-purpose um, agencies. So in 1985, North Carolina created 40 so-called local management entities. Uh, these were mom and pop uh, um, agencies, roughly one per county, uh, and they do person-centered planning, they authorize services, right? Um, as you can imagine, there was a very significant variation across the state, and, and there were some, some cozy deals, and some, uh, you know, hanky-panky, da 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 and um, the, the uh, state was obligated to pay whatever was uh, billed, so the inflation went up, right? And the state said that's too much independence. So the state decided to start merging them. So by 2008, these had merged into to 15 regions. That's the boxes around here. They're sort of color-coded, right? Um, initially, those were fee-for-service, and then they changed over to uh, the provider-led type managed care. And uh, by 2015, they have been further merged into eight uh, LME managed care organizations. These are all, again, provider-led, state-funded, right? And North Carolina is now planning further changes where these will be absorbed by huge payer-led managed care plans, the ones that I know about. And the overall trend, and this is very distressing, right? It takes away local control from parents and eventually gives it to Wall Street, right? So. You want to identify when this is happening in your state and try to interrupt it and you know keep things the way they were. So right now in this talk, I'm done talking about the small local provider-led state funded, uh, the mom and pops, right? And these are some states that, that I know of. There's probably other states too. And now I'm going to talk about the thing that I know, the huge national for private for-profit payer-led health insurers that originated as employer-sponsored health insurance plans otherwise known as Wall Street, right? So in short, and all they care about is profit, their bean counters. Uh, this is a very important slide because the commercial employer sponsored is the largest fraction of, so the most Americans are covered by a commercial employer sponsored plan. But over time, fewer employers are offering uh, health insurance as a benefit because the good jobs are either being automated or outsourced, there's mergers, uh, and they're being replaced by sort of gig, gig economy or part-time work that doesn't include. So the, uh, the, the sort of the, the market for this, for the health insurers is shrinking, right? At the same time, Medicaid rolls are increasing and Medicare is increasing because people, you know, boomers like, like all of us 
are uh, aging into Medicare. Um, and so in order to uh, maintain their revenue streams, these commercial employer sponsored plans are looking to expand and to take over Medicare and Medicaid as a privatization maneuver. Uh, it's also true there used to be hundreds of these health insurers. They've consolidated. There's been 500 mergers and acquisitions, and now they're down to a few dozen corporations. And who are they? These are names which everybody should probably have heard of by now. And these are big, right? That's the revenue. The combined revenue of all these uh, corporations is greater than the entire budget of any state, right? They are, they have very deep pockets, they're advised by the smartest consultants, um, and they're very aggressive. And they're coming after Medicaid. So they began enrolling uh, mainstream patients, the non-disabled population, maybe in the late 1990s. Uh, initially, the states kept the waiver populations um, out of managed care. It's, it's uh, not, not a really a good fit, and you'll see why that is, right? Then came the Great Recession and the fiscal cliff, as I said, right? You need a crisis. Don't let a crisis go to waste. So if we look in the past 20 years or so, the enrollment of Medicaid patients uh, is, is pretty high, and these are mostly people without disabilities, but the, the capture, the revenue, is not nearly as high because the uh, the most expensive Medicaid enrollees, like our family members, right, are uh, so far not in managed care. If we look at this slide another way around, from the standpoint of the insurance companies, every time you can convert a fee for service to a managed care, right, that's good. So so over time, we've seen less and less state fee for service spending, more and more managed care revenue. Uh, where is that going to go? What are the remaining revenue capture targets? Uh, and they are really long, well, hospitals, which we're not going to talk about today, and, and long-term services and supports, which are still mostly fee-for-service in most states, right? This includes institutional long-term care, ICFs and group homes, right? And home and community-based services, which, you know, it's not only IDD, but it's, it's, that's what IDD is all about, right? But, as I mentioned, these are two worlds that are really incompatible with each other, right? And there are some hurdles, and so I don't want to be completely negative today. There, there, you have some, some tricks and you have some ways of fighting this. And there are certain uh, incompatibilities and trouble that the big corporations are having to try to take over the IDD population. And if you can sort of magnify those in the press and to your legislators, then um, that may help to slow it down. The biggest one, as I mentioned, is person-centered planning, right? You know that inside out, and these plans know nothing whatsoever about it. Right? If that becomes a requirement, they have a very hard time. They would have to invest large amounts of money in the new bureaucracy, in new IT. Um, the standards don't even exist. The codes don't exist. This is something that they really would, it's going to take some time for them to, to be able to automate that. Information technology. All the doctors in the hospitals have EMR systems, the, the electronic medical records IT systems. Right? So the insurance companies are used to that. Right, they take on a new doctor, they say, you know, have your EMR spit it out this code to that address, me, right? Um, almost, well, very few, if any, of the IDD providers have anything close to that amount of information technology. In fact, they went into IDD because they didn't want to have to be nerds, right? They were more human-centered, right? And so this is, this is a problem because it's unclear who's going to pay for it. They're, I'll get to that in a minute, right? And finally, of course, no provider in his right mind or participant really wants this to happen. So they'll find ways of resisting, right? So we're kind of at the cusp right now. It's a little plus minus if this is going to really take off. And, you know, enough horror stories and it could it could die out. That happened actually to to managed care for physicians in the 80s, pissed off so many people that they had to, to, to roll it back in the, in, the, in the 90s, right? So, you know, this is it's not something that you can't win, but you're going to have to fight. Now, um, just to review what we've said so far, managed care is part of a widespread trend in state governments of moving responsibility for social and health services into the private sector. Medicaid managed care tends to reduce the public's access to state officials and the political process. Right now, you can go to your state, your elected representative and say, you know, this terrible thing happened or I want that thing fixed, right? And they can go to try to, to get the legislator to do something about it, right? Under managed care, they'll say, we can't, you know, our hands are tied because you know, we're not in charge anymore. It's that corporation. You go talk to, to, to United Healthcare and try to get their attention, right? 
Um, so it, it, it hides discussions about service cuts, policies behind a corporate veil. For this particular population, it's speculative and unproven. And they're just sort of doing it because they've done it for everything else and now let's, let's try to, you know, it, it, the people making these decisions don't understand. They're not thinking, right? They don't, they, they do not understand the personal, the personal um, price. Uh, it does nothing to address the, the major problems that we're all, we're all so familiar with, right? The, the long waiting lists, there's 500,000 people on waiting lists across the country, right? Shortage of IDD housing, shortage of direct service for the riders because the payment's not high enough, and of course, waste, fraud, and abuse that we can see in, in all the states, right? By diverting state Medicaid funding into corporate profits, the IDD managed care would make all these problems worse. Right? Um, now, state budget directors don't think that way. They want Medicaid managed care for only one reason, to cap costs. So they can go to, to their uh, voters and they can say, you know, we protected the state fisc, uh, we kept your taxes uh, down, right? Uh, so just, you know, it's a, it's, it boils down to a political battle, right? And there's a lot more of them than there are of you. Um, Medicaid managed care plans draw on huge corporate utilization management protocols to limit surface surface authorizations, right? Which you don't want, right? Uh, in contrast, you know who's on the other side? They, some states, not every state even sets up an ombudsman, but those states that do set up an ombudsman office, they should be small and make three people for a whole state, right? What, what can they do? <laughs> Medicare managed camp, care plans. Well, tell the state, if you want us to save you money, you're not going to look too close at what we do with it, right? And if we, you know, deny people service requests and so on, you're not going to come in and give us too hard of a time about it, right? So th there's, there's a little bit of a cat and mouse, and they're sort of finicky. They want things their way. That's a, that's a setup for fraud. Medicaid managed care plans run expensive, so it's in order to get into a state, right? They run expensive media and lobbying campaigns to discredit and misrepresent fee-for-service. They contrast, they say, fee-for-service is costly and fragmented. Now, there's a grain of truth to that. They say managed care is efficient and coordinated. But there, in fact, is no evidence that Medicaid managed care either saves states money or improves healthcare services, right? So, you know, they promise this, and let's look five years later and see what the result was. Um, and, uh, you know, the only way they can really, they can say, we save money is to make a hypothetical projection of what it would have been without them. And they can put in all sorts of assumptions there, right, and make it look rosy for them. In fact, there are numerous examples of chaos and provider bankruptcies caused by switching from fee for service to managed care. Because anytime you change a system, right, if you've been billing one way for the past 20 years, and someone says now you have to bill a different way, and not only that, instead of billing to just one state Medicaid agency, you have to bill to four different uh, insurance companies, and they all have their, their right. You know, things are going to fall through the cracks. It's just not going to work very smoothly at the beginning, right? Uh, and the LTSS providers have a very low uh, profit margin. They are not even permitted by law to set up a, a war chest, so they can't draw on reserves, so they don't have them, right? And if, if you go six months without being paid, some of them go under. That's a scenario we have seen in, in some states. Here's something that's, that's important. I think it's important. Detecting Medicaid fraud is more difficult than managed care than a fee for service. In fee for service, fraud looks like you claimed that you did a service and you bill for that and you actually didn't. Now there's a paper trail. So the auditors can come by and say, you know, you said you did uh, 200 procedures in this week, right? Uh, let's go check and whether, see whether you really did, right? Under managed care, the provider gets paid X amount, of, the, the insurance company gets paid a certain amount of money. And fraud there is where they deny services, but there's no paper trail because if they deny the service, right, there's nothing for the auditors to look at. So states really ought to be in intensifying their surveillance of Medicaid managed care utilization management and fraudulent service denials. But to the contrary, the states often view Medicaid privatization as a way to reduce state Medicaid regulation and oversight. So there's a risk that the states will somehow assume that market forces or regulate providers so the state won't have to. Now, if I'm taking care of you and you're not happy with me, you can complain to the state, you can complain to the insurance company, you can sue me, right, with a malpractice suit. So there is, the, and you can choose to go to some other neurologist, right? Um, none of those really applies in the IDD 
sector, right? You can't just switch agencies, right? Um, uh, there's no money in it, so the, the, there's no plaintiff lawyers who are willing to help you to do a lawsuit, right? So there's, and, and you'll see that it's not even a market. There's no competition. So there are some vulnerabilities, and I wanted to um, point these out as uh, strategies for you to think about how you may address these questions in your own state. Uh, one is a aggressive state rate setting. Managed care companies want to earn more than they spend. So if the amount of money they're paid by the state is low, the profit margin is, is narrow, and they, they don't like that, and they're liable to take their marbles and go and go home. Another is uh, person-centered planning, for as I explained, right, that they have no idea what that is. Um, if the uh, state puts in extensive protections for providers and patients and due process rights and so on, uh, all that's going to cost the, the um, managed care company more um, and, of course, provide opposition and resistance. Right? So let's go through these with some examples. The initial capitated rate, if I'm switching from fee-for-service onto managed care, how are we going to decide how much to pay? Because remember, we're paying a lump sum at the beginning of the year, right? And the way it's supposed to be done is you look at the previous year, it has been costing us this amount, and so we're going to pay that amount respectively to the managed care company, right? If your state was one that didn't pay much for Medicaid to start with, right, then there's not, the, the, the rates for the managed care plans are gonna be low and they won't be happy with that. Uh, plans are moving in, they're like national plans, they've never been in your state, right? And now they're moving in and they have to set up the IP from their end also, the startup costs, and so they have to recruit a network and so on, uh, and uh, the state will say, uh, you told us it was going to cost less. You know, you, we're not going to give you five hundred million a uh, grant to, to, to right, for a startup funds. Um, fee for service Medicaid uh, historically, the administrative costs are approximately somewhere between three to five percent. Right? Managed care plans demand a fifteen percent overhead to do their administration, but also to pay off their shareholders and to pay their executives, right, and for profit. Right? So just think of some math, right? If the services are going to stay the same the overall cost is gonna go up by about 10%, right? But if the total cost is the same, the services have to be cut by about 10% to make room for the profit, right? So that's a, you know, who would take that deal? That's a setup for, for, for trouble. Uh, managed care plans, if they uh, enroll high cost patients without corresponding high cost, high uh, rates, some, sometimes called a high needs rate sale, uh, then they get unhappy. And what does it mean when they're unhappy? If they can't earn a profit, they will simply leave the state. Now, the poster um, states for, for this are Kansas and Iowa. Right now, Iowa decided it's going to move its uh, Medicaid into managed care. So they put out a request for proposals, and they got a list of about 10 plans, and then they looked at the plans and they rated them in terms of desirability, and they took the top three plans. They, in, they implemented it a year later, United Healthcare, the number one plan, said, um, uh, we can't stay in the state on what you're paying us. You've got to pay us more. And Iowa said, no, we're not. We're not going to pay you more. And United Healthcare up and left. So Iowa had to go down to the fourth one on the list. Right? And um, you know, a few months later, the number two plan said, uh, we can't make it on what you're paying us. And not only that, we're $150 million in the red. So you have to make us whole and then raise our rates. And the state of Iowa said, no way. So they left. So now they're down to the fifth one on the list. And you know, the chance that one of these lower plans is going to make it work when the biggest ones couldn't, extremely low. It's incredibly chaotic because you know, every time there's a new change, there's new protocols, right? It, this is just, it's, it's criminal, if you ask me. So as I explained earlier, the uh, person-centered planning, the Medicaid managed care plans are optimized for, for um, health, for doctors and hospitals. Everything is coded. There's 80,000 um, diagnosis codes. There's 100,000 procedure codes, right? And this is all with a lot of number crunching. And, and all the doctors and hospitals have electronic medical records, right? So you can plug it in, da, 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 and make it work. And um, so the managed care plans are sort of streamlined to, to, to do things that way, right? Um, this is from the uh, website Medicaid.gov. Uh, uh, ICFID provides active treatment, right? A continuous, aggressive, and consistent implementation of a program of specialized and generic training, treatment, and health 
or related services directed towards helping the enrollee function with as much self-determination and independence as possible. After treatment is based on an evaluation and individualized program plan, IPP, by an interdisciplinary team. Right? That should be familiar to everybody here. So the IDP community has been doing person-centered planning for 50 years, right? And the whole rest of the world is trying to catch up to you. The last thing that a state should do is to replace decades of compassionate person-centered planning expertise with corporate health insurance robots and algorithms, right? This is a very big deal. Other things that uh, managed care companies don't particularly like is when the providers they're trying to, to um, contract with um, uh, complain. Um, the, one of the first states to do Medicaid managed care was Arizona. And I spoke to the, um, one of the regulators at that time, and he said, we had to ride herd on those plans, right? We made sure that they did the right thing for the people in Arizona, right? Unfortunately, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, cowboy attitude is, is not so common in other states and more recently. Um, if, if you make the expenses of the managed care company high, Right? That's going to cut their profit margin. Many of these managed care companies, let's say, so United Healthcare is huge, right? They're going to take their money from whatever state, uh, Medicaid money, and the state doesn't always know what happens to that money, right? It may just get thrown into the kitty to some degree, right? Um, because the, you know, when the plans contract with the states, the states are often kind of knuckle under and you know, let them do what they want. So it's very important to know where the money goes. As I stated, uh, managed care for IDD is unproven. It's experimental. The information technology is primitive, right? Um, and uh, to destroy, you know, taking Medicaid payments and failing to provide services is the definition of fraud. And finally, um, provider options. So here's one scenario. Um, let's suppose you have a state with a large rural population. Uh, rural providers may be the only one for miles around, right? And the managed care plan comes and says, we'd like you to, uh, to uh, join our network and, and we'll pay you X amount. And he said, why should I take that amount? That's not enough. Um, you know, uh, I need more money because there's startup costs, right? I'm the only one, et cetera, right? So the managed care plans may not be able to get a full network. Now, some participant with a disability in that area therefore cannot get services. That leads to bad publicity. Bad publicity leads to legislative investigations and scrutiny and eventually to lawsuits. So these are some red flags, things that um, you might want to look for. Is your state doing these things, right? Uh, if the state needs to do something new, um, like to create networks, right? Are they contracting with private um, consultants rather than developing in-house expertise? The states often don't want to hire more people. Often uh, these consultants are from out of state, so they're national, right? And so there's chaos in the state agencies. So keep an eye out for that, right? If there's involvement of any major Medicaid, med, the ones I listed earlier, they're going to bring their utilization management people, which is, when you hear those words, think service denials. Right? Mm -hmm. um, one nice thing about Medicaid is the fair hearing. If you don't like a decision, you can then go to the state fair hearing. It used to be you could just do that straight away. And um, CMS, of all people, the federal government, said, well, we want, when anyone's enrolled in the Medicaid managed care, they have to exhaust the internal appeals of the Medicaid managed care plan before you can go to fair hearing. And the reason CMS is doing this is because it's, it's making life easier for these plans. So they only have to have one way of thinking, right? So they don't, you know, they don't have to have um, a certain appeal process for the non-Medicaid and a different one for Medicaid. That's too confusing for them. Yeah, these poor, huge corporations, right? Uh, so, but watch out, CMS, you know, they're not necessarily in your corner either, right? Um, something you want to watch for is a pre-packaged pre assessment batteries instead of person-centered planning, because as I said, they like to work with numbers, right? Most are designed for nursing home populations. In fact, if you want to see what your states have in mind for IDD, just look at what they're already doing to the seniors in nursing homes and with the home care services. So the state of uh, Arkansas, not to pick on them, right, um, has an, an, an assessment method uh, for seniors, of 80-year-old people, right? And they recently introduced a new one, and the, uh, the, um, the formula was such that 30% of people were suddenly no longer eligible for Medicaid. Home community services, right? 
Uh, you know, it, it, it's not clear that Arkansas is going to let that stand. You know, there's a lot of protests. And one nice thing about Arkansas is that the papers get wind of things and publicize them very quickly. None of these that I've seen, these assessment batteries, are really validated. They don't capture intellectual delays. They don't ask you, can you use your hand? So they miss people with cerebral palsy, right? Uh, and there's a lot of disorders that they just don't even look at because they're really made for nursing home people who either have severe arthritis or they have Alzheimer's disease or previously normal people, right? States will often move quickly, right? An aggressive managed care timeline, which is it's insane. You know, they say, we're going to do this uh, transition in 12 months or 18 months, right? Which is nuts. Uh, and they'll say, well, you know, we gave these new, we're creating new agencies, right? And we gave them startup funds, but those startup funds are running out, right? And they need their revenue. So we're going to let them launch, even though they're not really ready, right? How do they do this? They make a sham readiness review that's based on, you know, on uh, assertions and assurances uh, rather than a live demonstration, for example, happens all over the country. Right? Uh, in fact, it takes months and years to change safely. Right? Overselling information technology. This is one of my bugaboos. Um, good IT costs hundreds of millions of dollars. How do I know that? Because that's what hospitals have spent, put it together, and that's what doctors' offices have, have had to spend. Right? Um, no state is going to give its, its IDD providers uh, uh, you know, $500 million to set up an IT system to be compatible. Where is the money coming from? Right? So be very wary of untested IT systems. So in New York State, for example, um, uh, ran, uh, rolled out a provider-led managed care, career coordination system. Uh, they couldn't afford the, the fancy um, doctor quality uh, IT systems, so they, they they went and bought a very cheap one. The readiness review, which which CMS signed off on, right, uh, was assertions and screenshots, which they could have photoshopped for all I know, and did not include a live demonstration. It launched last July, and it's been a nightmare. The thing can do barely 10% of what it was supposed to be doing. So the providers have no money for new IT. So if your state says that we're going to put the ID population into managed care, you want to make sure that they set people up to succeed. Right? There's another term you may uh, hear, value-based payment. So you know we're going to do managed care, and that's leading the way to value-based payments. We're going to pay for a good outcome, which in medicine, you could do that. You could say, hey, the person came in with an ear infection. Is the ear infection gone? Or they came in with appendicitis. Did the appendicitis come out? Yeah, right? It's very straightforward. but. There are no standard definition of values. Imagine, you know, everybody, if you turn to your neighbor, right, you know, that your loved one's needs are all different. Right? You can't really quantify that and turn it into numbers. And the nuclear options that you really want to run for the hills, if you hear private equity, they're just coming to steal your money, <laughs> and uh, block grants. And um, um, two years ago, we almost got block grants, right? I was going to do that. And if it wasn't for John McCain, right, um, I think that was a little, little bit uh, staged, but. But uh, it, you know, it was a scary moment. You know, I hope to God that we never get block grants. Block grants would be like capitating, um, you know, on steroids in the managed care. Um, so those are things to be looking out for. Um, so it really, how happy these plans are depends on how much profit. So it really depends on the rate that they're paid. Right? Um, rate setting, unfortunately, is very opaque. There's insider sweetheart deals. It's all about monopoly negotiating power, who has who else over the barrel, right? There's no input from participants. You can't even find out when it's going on, right? Um, managed care, Medicaid managed care plans do not compete, do not competitively bid on capitated rates. So it's not like the state says, all right, there's three, three, five plans that I want you guys to send in a bid, right? And we'll take the lowest bidder or something, right? It doesn't work that way. The state says, this is what the managed care rate is going to be, and every plan gets it, right? So what market? There is no market. Market forces cannot work because everyone's getting the same amount of money no matter what they do, right? So you know the idea that market forces are going to you know be the invisible hand of the marketplace that makes everything good is is crazy, right? So if if the states put in capacity requirements, meaning uh, due process, meaning that there has to be you know they have to account for how they spent money, things like that, right? If you increase their expenses, uh, governors often don't put any of those in. And then problems arise, and then it's only later that the legislature comes along, having heard from its constituents all these problems, and then tries to add 
expenses in. And so there's a few cases where um, uh, managed care was implemented, and then a couple years later, it was time to renew it, and the legislatures have said, hey, we're not gonna renew it so fast, right? We're gonna take a second look at this. New Hampshire is an example of that, right? Um, so in, in the whole, switching from fee-for-service to managed care, it could potentially lower, or it could raise overall costs, right? We you get your money's worth depends on state oversight. So this is really something to be lobbying at, you know, at the state level. Um, what about the federal government? CMS requires actuarially sound capitated rates. That's all I say. But they don't really define that. All that means is that you know you have to, to give them more money than they spend so that there's you know they don't go into the red, right? Uh, and that's about it. CMS really is only interested in their bunch of accountants, right? Thousands of accountants, right? Uh, they do not really pay attention to the quality. They have an, an office of inspector general of the HHS that's supposed to go, but that they don't have any teeth either. They can say we found this problem, and then they hand the information to CMS to enforce it. And CMS may or may not act on that. Right? So you know, it's it's there are a few cases where states get ahead of the federal government on civil rights protections, but this is one of them. This is one of them where states are doing a better job than than the federal government. If you say healthcare, the federal government is incredibly squeamish about uh, instituting protections. Uh, rates are calculated by accounting consultants. The initial rates, as I said, are supposed to be based on fever service experience. And the providers are supposed to, usually supposed to be paid uh, about the same rate as they were getting, at least for a year. So there's a certain period of time where the rates get grandfathered in. Then, after that, Managed care providers start screwing providers. How do I know this? <laughs> I worked at the Medicaid managed care plan for 13 years. Now, I was on the inside. As an insider, I was paid very well indeed. Right? But we also contracted with outside providers. And so the analogy would be the Medicaid managed care plan, the IDD plan, right? And the IDD providers. And how is the plan going to treat the providers? Well, how did we treat our providers? Right? We offered outside providers. 80% of the fee for service Medicaid rates. Now, nobody can make a living on Medicaid rates, and we offered a 20% discount. Right? None of the top tier hospitals wanted anything to do with our plan. Right? But there's too many hospitals in New York City. Right? So we played uh, two struggling hospitals against each other. Like we were at uh, you know, Brooklyn Hospital for a few years, and then um, uh, Brookdale came along with a better offer. So we switched everything over to Brookdale. Right, and a few years later, uh, Brooklyn came back with it, and so we switched everything to the Brooklyn Hospital, which you can do in acute care medicine because most patients aren't in the hospital for very long. But imagine that in you know long-term services and supports, right? It's crazy. Um, over time, the patients became increasingly unhappy, and it led to a death spread. So the, several of our outside providers went out of business. You know, it may or may not have been 100 percent our fault, but that's what you see. You know. It's commonly seen. The more the people, the providers have experience with the managed care system, the less they like it, and the more likely they are to uh, go bankrupt from it. It costs providers a lot of money to survive under managed care. And the highest cost, as I said, is high quality information technology. If a hospital wants an, uh, a, an IT system, an electronic medical record system, there are about 10 vendors out there. The biggest one's Epic, one called Cerner, there's one called Allscripts, GE, the other ones, right? And any one of them can provide, a, and it, it's not going to be cheap, and it requires a lot of work to make it work, right? But there are companies at least that make them, right? Not one company makes an IT system for uh, the long-term services and support sector because there's no market for it. Why is that? Well, it's very important to have this because you can't manage what you can't see. Congress gave doctors and hospitals $40 billion, roughly 10 years ago, and we gave it to these various companies I just named, right? And they made the systems to implement, right? And the, the payer that managed care plans are used to this. They expect that you will have good IT, right? So they're gonna come to the long-term services and supports provider and say, we expect you guys to plug in just like the doctors do, and they'll say, we have no system, plug in, right? Well, how much money do you think Congress gave to the long-term services and supports sector for their IT? Any law guesses? Zero. Zero. Right. In fact, the 2016 uh, uh, law called 21st Century Cures Act essentially said if a long-term services and support provider wants IT, 
They should subsume themselves to an existing hospital system, <laughs> give up their autonomy, and that's how they're going to get IT, ask the hospital to expand it. Who in their right mind would do that, right? You know, the, the, the way that these politicians think. Now, it's very important you have this because without it, you have no chance. The, the plans will just not pay you. If you can't build them the way that they're used to, months will go by when things are not happening. Um, I wanted to give you, you know, some points to go away. If you, if you run into a politician, tell them, don't give control over IDD funding to huge for-profit private corporations who have no expertise in person-centered planning and no historical connection to IDB. IDB, many key managed care plans will gradually look and act like commercial managed care plans. IDB, Medicaid managed care, will worsen all the major funding and capacity problems. There's, there's nothing in this plan to make that any better. They've already wreaked havoc in a number of states. And radical change, for the sake of change, can be lethal. We know this. All right, so I'll stop there because <laughs> this is the I went over. You talked about Iowa and the corporations leaving. And they're down, they lost the top, they lost the second, they're down to number three, four, and five. When they get down to 9, 10, and 11, they're suddenly, you know, and, and administrations change. When a new administration comes in and says, okay, this is not working. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to go back to fee-for-services. It seems to me as though when you transition to managed care, it's done carefully and over a period of time and resources are put in place and so on. If you try to transform back to fee-for-services, the managed care companies are going to say, okay, we're out of here tomorrow morning. Empty the office. We're right. Going. And there is no transition back. It's but like when we talked question, about right. what, cutting ICFs. They, what, what happened to the old system? Right? If you replace the old system, you know those people have to, to earn a living. They're going to go do something else. You can't restore it. You can't reconstitute it two years later. Right? So this is something we really have to prevent from happening in the first place. Thank you very much.